The next part of this lecture deals with how to determine how much energy we can get out of a redox reaction. In order to explain that, students need to understand standard reduction potentials. To explain the energy from cell potentials, we need to think about electrons as drops of water. Let's think about the energy change of a waterfall. The energy change that the water experiences is going to be equal to the amount of water that falls over the waterfall. Obviously, you can get more energy loss from a large river versus a small creek. Also, the weight of the water. Water is one gram per milliliter. But what if you had seawater, which is 1.04 grams per milliliter? That has greater density, so you would get more energy from that dropping to a lower level. And finally, the height of a fall. A 10-foot fall obviously has more energy release than a 2-foot fall. That is why there is a negative in front of this equation. We're thinking about energy release. Now let's think about the energy change of falling electrons. The amount of water falling could be proportional to the number of electrons. The density of the water would be proportional to the weight of the electrons, and the height of the fall is equal to the voltage difference. So in formula speak, the free energy change is equal to minus NFE cell. N is the moles of electrons transferred in a redox reaction. F is the Faraday constant. That is the charge on one mole of electrons, which turns out to be 96,485 coulombs per mole of electron. The energy change from the fall, or E cell, we represent as the energy level of the cathode minus the energy level of the anode, which we measure in volts. Volts can also be expressed as joules per coulomb. So if we look at the units here, we have moles of electron, coulombs per mole of electron, and a volt, which is a joule per coulomb. Canceling the units, we wind up with units of joules, which is an excellent energy unit. One thing about the sign change, though. When the voltage of a cell is positive, the free energy change is negative, so we have a spontaneous reaction. When the voltage change of the cell is negative, the free energy change is positive, so we have a non-spontaneous reaction. Now, how do we determine E cell, or the voltage when an electron falls? I think you would agree that if the nucleus is down below, the electrons in the red orbital are at lower energy than the blue orbital. Or if we represent this as the Bohr model of the atom, again, the electrons that are in the red level are closer to the nucleus, and the electrons in the blue level are further from the nucleus. Let me relate that to voltage. Electrons that experience more negative reduction potentials are far from the nucleus. They are out in the cloud with the other electrons. Electrons which experience a more positive reduction potential are closer to the nucleus. So negative is further away from the nucleus than positive, and therefore negative has higher energy orbitals than positive. So what's in the middle if you go from negative to positive? Internationally, we have all agreed that the standard hydrogen electrode is our zero value. This is expressed as two hydrogen ions reacting with two electrons to make hydrogen gas. So worldwide, this is considered the zero which all other reduction reactions are measured against. We are in the redox chapter right now, so to keep the reaction simple, we're going to stick with H+. 
Later in the acid-base chapter, you'll realize that H plus in water actually forms a bond, and we're talking about the hydronium ion. But you notice this makes the reaction a bit more complicated. So let's stick with H plus while we're in the redox chapter. So here is a selection of standard reduction potentials from our textbook, and you notice the standard hydrogen electron is in the middle. Then we have values that are more negative and values that are more positive. Notice that these are standard reduction potentials. So each one of these reactions involves electrons on the reactant side, and a material that is going to be reduced by the addition of electrons. Therefore, the oxidizing agents are on the reactant side, and the reducing agents, the ones that now have the electrons, are on the product side. So our reduction potential table in the book actually very nicely lines up with nuclear energy levels. If we consider the nucleus down below here, oxidizing agents have empty orbitals, and you can see that potassium has the empty orbital that is furthest from the nucleus. Reducing agents have electrons in their valence orbitals, and we can see that F1- has electrons that are very close to the nucleus. And if you're wondering why sometimes there's one electron and sometimes there's two, I've paid attention to the reaction. The first reaction involves the addition of one mole of electrons, and the second reaction involves two moles of electrons. So our table is very naturally set up to help us identify strong oxidizing agents and strong reducing agents. The strongest reducing agent on our table is potassium which has a high energy electron. The strongest oxidizing agent on our table is F2, and second best is silver 1+, plus, which has low energy empty orbitals. So whenever electrons fall from high energy orbitals to low energy orbitals, we have a spontaneous reaction. So on our reduction table, anything falling downhill to the left is spontaneous. On the other hand, weak reducing agents have low energy electrons, and weak oxidizing agents have high energy empty spaces. So anything on our table that goes uphill when we go to the left represents a non-spontaneous redox reaction. Here is a question for you. What change in potential does an electron experience when it moves from an initial potential of minus 0.8 volts to a final potential of minus 0.3 volts. Is the change spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Let me remind you that any change in chemistry is always final minus initial. So if my initial is minus 0.8, that would be a minus minus 0.8 volts here, and my final is minus 0.3. So hopefully you can take negative 0.3 minus a minus 0.8 and come up with a value. And I remind you that whenever E cell has one particular sign, delta G has the opposite sign.